Dr. Czernak, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, and it's rather really nice to uh, meet you as uh, you're a little bit Swiss too, I guess, since you're the one who pioneered liver transplantation in uh, Switzerland, in uh, Bern, and you are indeed very well known in, uh, in my country, for sure. So I will, I think we will have an interesting morning talking about different aspects of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, so I will uh, focus mostly on, uh, on liver resection, but give also uh, an overview of a few uh, aspects. So HCC is the most frequent liver tumor worldwide. It increases in incidence also in most countries, and it occurs in about 1 to 5% in patients with any kind of cirrhosis. This is a particular challenge, but in the field of oncology, because we don't have to deal only with cancer problem, but we have to deal with liver disease. And the major challenge, as very often, we have problem with the liver pool, liver reserve, which of course impact on prognosis and the treatment. The vascular invasion is an important issue, difficult to diagnose, but has also a strong impact on outcome. And surgical resection can apply to only probably 20 to 30 percent at maximum. If we look at the incidence here, some slide from the United States here, we can see that since 76 to uh, now, about now, there has been an increase in the incidence. We see that the Asian population stay about the same. It is mostly related to hepatitis B. On the other hand, in contrast, in the Hispanic or the white or the black population, it has increased quite dramatically, mostly related to hepatitis C. And this is what we observed in Switzerland and many other countries uh, in Europe, an increase in hepatitis C. So the different treatment here that we have, and there is still consensus conference, every meeting, HPB, we talk about HCC, what treatment to apply. And the reason in any meeting we can still talk about it is that the door is open for many treatments, and there is no, no very, very good studies that convincingly show which way we can go. Now let's focus on liver resection for hepatocellular carcinoma. And one of the main topics has been to target and to select the right patient. Every HPB surgeon knows that if you do this in the wrong patients, then the chance of surviving for this patient is extremely low. And if you do it in the perfect patient, then they will do very well. So what are the criteria? We, mo most people will still use the child classification, which will mean the good patient will be the one who has no ascites, has no cholestasis, and has a good uh, coagulation factors. There has been a little bit more tests that have been used, for example, the ICG green test used mostly in Asia. I have introduced that about five years or so in my program. We use that routinely. The, uh, we'll talk about that a bit more later, later. The active hepatitis is clearly a risk factor for resection. Portal hypertension is highly discussed, <coughs> challenged by some, but is without any doubt a major factor for poor outcome for liver resection and a reason, for example, to go for transplant. And many centers now speak about assessing liver regeneration. One of the problems the cirrhotic patient, if you do some major liver surgery, is that the liver is unable to regenerate. And if you can show before that it does, then you have a good chance to have a good outcome. If it does not, then you have a good chance to have a bad outcome. What are the results? If we look at different series, and we often try to compare what's going on from Asia, they have a pretty high incidence, again, mostly related to hepatitis B, except maybe Korea, when they have a lot of hepatitis C, but Japan is mostly, or China, is mostly hepatitis B. And what we have in our, in, in our country is mostly hepatitis C or alcohol-related uh, uh, cirrhosis. And what we can see, this is relatively large series. We can see that most of the series have cirrhosis here in Asia, is a relatively low number, usually is exclusively or mostly in cirrhotic patient, and Occidental II in, the, uh, in our country, it's also related to cirrhosis. Just of note that hepatitis B, the HEC can occur in absence of cirrhosis, just a bit of fibrosis, while for hepatitis C, this is always, almost always, in the setting of uh, cirrhotic uh, liver. The mortality is also highly viable. I think this low mortality is exceptional. Everybody who operates on this patient and takes some risk has some mortality and is clearly very different than the non cirrhotic liver. And I think the mortality is above 5%, probably in most centers, but uh, <coughs> relatively aggressive. And the five year survival is relatively consistent. I think it's fair to this about 50%. 55% of patients will live five years after uh, liver uh, resection. 
Uh, there is a number of risk factors. I will not go all to this. They are well known. They are very difficult to quantify what risk factor is. Clearly, cirrhosis is one and portal hypertension, and I will not go into detail. I think we'll discuss later that. This was an important paper that I have applied by the group from Barcelona who reviewed a series of liver resection for hepatocellular carcinoma and found here this is the survival of a time, so this is not just short-term but long-term survival, and demonstrate that if you have no portal hypertension here, the survival is very good. You can see 75% here, we really match liver transplant or any other the condition on the, on, the op on the opposite. If you go in patient with portal hypertension, and in addition, some cholestasis, then it's a complete different curve. And from this data, many HPV surgeons involved in that have decided to not to consider any liver, to, liver resection or many only min, uh, very uh, small liver resection in patients with sport and hypertension. Maybe it could be interesting to discuss this topic after and know what you are doing in your center. This is what is used, a bit complex, I will not go into many detail. This is the Barcelona uh, staging system. There's been also a lot of discussion which one is best, which one applied to us. Uh, I like the group from Barcelona, I find that a little bit complicated and I do not use this in my practice, but we have to talk about it since the one is always in the literature. And we go for resection, then here this is again the very early stage. Uh, they will say this is a single lesion here, uh, if you have a stage A single lesion, it go for resection. I think everybody or most will agree with this strategy. It is still unclear here when we go to a more advanced stage here in terms of the number of nodules, in terms of different positive nodes, etc. Where do we go with this population? And I wanted to share with you also a study from, from Milano here, uh, from Dr. Torzilli, uh, will be published soon, who try to compare here did a survey, many patients here, and basically challenge uh, this uh, staging system by showing here stage A, B, and C. Here, this is an absolute contraindication for many for transplantation, but he found here, if you look here at the survival proportion of survival, there's still a 40% stage C here, and if you look at disease-free survival, there is not so much difference, and the conclusion for this paper is that many, in fact, apply to this group, although everybody will say you apply only to this one, and it challenge, and it challenge to say it could be acceptable, in fact, for some patient to go beyond this stage A and suggest to change the uh, guideline in Europe and US in terms of who, or who is not candidate for liver resection. This is what I want to share, what we basically apply uh, in Zurich, the way we think in our diagram in terms of resection or not resection. So we have our cirrhotic patient with uh, um, HCC. If they are here, and we speak of a major liver resection, I will say for uh, when you have to remove more than three segments, for example, or formal uh, uh, right in the hepatectomy, uh, here if they are child B or C ascites, we would not go for resection, almost without exception. If it's not the case, we're pretty conservative, then we will consider portal hypertension in a simple way. Sometimes we measure the portal pressure. Most of the time, we're happy by looking at the the spleen, whether they have eyes or the, or the platelets. If they do not, then we will calculate whether we take more than 50% of the volume. If this is not the case, we have no portal hypertension child, I would just do it. Maybe basically we ignore uh, the cirrhosis of this liver. If it's not the case, uh, that means we take more, that's a major hepatectomy, then we do the ITG green test here, like they do in Japan, and if a perfect ITG green, we will go for it. If it's intermediate, then we would proceed with the portal vein embolization to test a bit the regenerative ability of this liver and to have more liver on the, on, on the, the side that will be left behind. If this is poor, then it's an absolute contraindication here. The mortality is almost 100% if you start to do this surgery into this. And here, when we do the portal vein embolization, either we have a good response, we go for surgery. We have no good response, we don't go for surgery. That's a bit the way we, we try to teach our fellow, and we apply that uh, in, in our patients. If we look at some of the data, we'll go quickly here through some meta-analysis, some data. We can discuss the quality of this data, and they are not always extremely good. But basically, here, there's some points. So anatomic resection was shows, if you look here, this is this diagram. Here is better if it's anatomic, better if it's non-anatomic resection. And here, when they look at all these series, the outcome here was better if it's non-anatomic resec for resection of the HCC. If we look at the risk of intrahepatic recurrence here, there is less. So if you do an anatomic resection, it makes also sense. Then you significantly decrease the risk 
of uh, recurrence of this HCC in the liver. The main point here, and I think that's the problem, is the recurrence of the disease, and you can see after resection, <coughs> the recurrence rate is about 80%. Some would say that basically all patients, almost all patients, will recur with the HCC. The reason either is de novo, most of the time is de novo, particularly after some time, uh, since this patient hepatitis B, hepatitis C, so they have just the condition that they will develop another cancer. And here, how can we prevent this recurrence? Can we improve survival? I show just a few uh, data here. This is the technique from Jacques Belgitti developed that, which is this hanging maneuver. Basically, you, the idea is not to mobilize either the side. You can go with here, uh, whatever, uh, silastic tube, whatever you want to put here between the cava, and we can do a, a transection here, and here there is a landmark study here that has been partially reproduced by others, by the group from Hong Kong, who basically test in a randomized trial this so-called anterior approach versus the mobilization of the right lobe, when for some time you have to push the right lobe on the left side, you have some ischemia and you ligate all the cardiac branches, versus just going up front uh, in the anterior approach. This is 60 patients that were randomized in this group. The, the, the sample size can be challenged, but that's a fair number. And what they show here, and that's very interesting here, is the survival over time. You can see go to five-year survival, dramatic improvement with the anterior approach with a 70% versus less than 50% with the conventional approach. And I think this paper has convinced many HPV surgeons to change the technique and to, uh, to do the liver section from an anterior approach. There will be a topic later on here on laparoscopy, so I will not say too much uh, here. Uh, I've got a few papers here, one paper from Belly from Italy, when were they showing in a relatively large series of patients the open approach versus laparoscopy, and you can see advantage for the laparoscopy in terms of morbidity or mortality, and it reached a uh, significance that was published a few years ago in the British Journal of uh, surgery. If they were looking at overall survival, this is for survival, no difference between one and the uh, other one here and the meta-analysis here that was also uh, published very recently uh, here show that if we look at the operative time, at least in these people, there was no difference. The positive mar margin in fact favor laparoscopy, bopartite blood loss favor laparoscopy, the transfusion rate favor laparoscopy, hospital stay the same, morbidity the same, liver failure the same, 30-day mortality also the same. So basically, in favor of minimally invasive uh, surgery, we have to be very careful, and I think we'll discuss later here. I think where we, we try to sell this, there is publication bias, no doubt, about this field. There is selection bias, no doubt, and there is center bias, meaning that uh, that can be done in center that they've expensive laparoscopy, not uh, everywhere, but this data certainly cannot be uh, ignored. What about radio frequency here? The, the, the people in China um, have been very interested, and Italy also, in this, in this approach here. I show you here one paper published in the Annals of Surgery two years ago, pretty large series here. They took HCC that were in the Milan criteria, meaning more or less than three lesions, the maximum five centimeters, and the classical criteria, no uh, met and good uh, liver reserve in this patient. And that's the data. They show interesting data in some way. They look at major complication here, much less with the radio frequency. That's no surprise here if you do resection. Hospital mortality, they did not have any, and hospital stay was pretty long, but anyway, it was much shorter with the RFA. Surprising that it's so long, but still significant in their hand. So here from the risk, and that's again no surprise, the radio frequency is superior to the mobility, the, the open support procedure. On the other hand, when we look at overall survival, or disease-free survival, this favor dramatically the resection versus the radio frequency in this group. And from this paper, you still have to con conclude that in most cases, open or the laparoscopic procedures of the resection is better than uh, radio frequency. Certainly, the story is not closed uh, with this. And when they were looking at the recurrence after RFA, uh, they found, like all the paper, the late, the new, about all will do that, 80%, but local, about 10% of the radio frequency in their series. Uh, that's what, sorry, it's not from China, that was from Italy. They found here that it was a recurrence. And here there is certainly, Dr. Lancioni is a radiologist, but he disclosed this 10% recurrence at the site of uh, the radio uh, frequency. Now, that's not the topic, so I will not talk too much or very about liver transplantation here. 
And that's the debate. Do we go for transplantation? Do we go for liver resection? I mean, clearly, the liver transplantation, the argument is that you have a multifocal disease. If not at the same time, it is. This is clearly the best oncologic resection. All the liver is gone. You, had the, the other, you cure the cirrhosis. We have this underlying liver disease. And you have right away a normal liver function after that. So this is very attractive to think about liver transplantation. The major problem is, of course, the timing. You don't want to do too early. You have a decision. And this tumor will grow. And at some point, it's too grow and does not qualify to grow too, um, too big and does not qualify for liver transplantation here with this dropout reported depending on how quickly you can have an organ, but it's certainly significant and it's two to four percent per month. So uh, it goes relatively quickly after two years, most of the patients are no longer candidate. So the question is basically here at this stage, what do we do at this stage? Do we go for a resection or ablation here? And this comes with the concept here, still very controversial concept of doing resection before transplantation and what exactly we try to do. And the concept here is basically to do the concept either of bridge of salvage. Here you have a small HCC, you will do a resection here. You do nothing until you have a recurrent disease and when you have a recurrent disease, you go for a salvage liver transplantation versus the bridge. The bridge will be to do at that point, you do your uh, resection here and you don't wait to have another tumor here. You have liver disease, cirrhosis, and here you go and here will be the bridge. So what about the salvage? With a lot of discussion, try to save organ uh, because we don't have enough organ to basically try to resect as many as you can and retransplant when they need, when they have recurrent disease. And it is very controversial papers and I will just go quickly to a few uh, of this paper is from Hong Kong, published here some years ago, a relatively large group of patients, and every time they try to look at a population which is eligible for liver transplantation or liver uh, resection here, and they were considering this strategy of salvage uh, liver transplantation. So here what they found, just to summarize this data, that 80% of the patients who have recurrent disease could get transplant. So they were favoring that. They said do resection, wait, because most of them, when they recur, we can do that. Important here is probably the etiology that was mostly in this uh, Chinese population from Hong Kong where hepatitis B. Daniel Sherkey from France also did a similar study at that point. He went here for 60 or 70 uh, resection of HEC within the Milan criteria, followed this patient for five years, found recurrent in half of them. That's what we may expect and it could do here again in 80%, so basically the same data as in Hong Kong. So here conclusion from Dr. Sherkey was to say, okay, let's just go for a resection because 80% of those who recur, we can still do a liver transplant in this with, in addition, good outcome after uh, these uh, procedures. Now here, another group here, that's the group from, uh, from Paul Bruce with Rene Adam and Henri Bismuth, here come with the total opposite conclusion here and saying that we should do exactly the opposite here. That was one of the early paper here published. Here, this is about 100 liver resection for HCC, and they look at the tumor record, 77%, that everybody agreed this is very frequent, but only 23%, very few, were candidate. Most of them, they could not be here for liver transplantation for many reasons. It was either not in the criteria, extra hepatic disease, etc. And even worse, when they look at the outcome here, so they compare here, they did a match group of patients which had immediately liver transplantation, so no resection, and they have the five-year survival of 60%, 2003. This is what everybody can reproduce with the Milan criteria today is about between, uh, 50, uh, between 60 and 70% five-year survival. But when they took the patient who, who had a resection before, then the outcome was completely different. So not only very few could reach the stage of transplant when they recur the disease, but the outcome was very poor. And that's what we are facing here, two completely different results from center who have experience in this condition. And the conclusion here is that don't do it. Now, we may go a little bit more. That's a paper uh, uh, that has never been published. I don't know why, uh, but it was presented, an interesting study looking at the etiology. And it's intuitively correct. I mean, here, this is a number of patients, 50 patients, which ate CV. So here we have hepatitis C. The other are either mixture or mostly hepatitis B. 
And here, what, and, and Belgiti was one also who favored resection and then liver transplantation, but for this condition here, he found the recurrence 50%. Again, we have the same figure here, but here, in, in opposition to the hepatitis B or the other data that he published before, only 40% could be transplanted when they have recurrent disease. And here, uh, the salvage was not possible. That's a different reason. Most of the time, because they have too many lesions, large lesions, polar vein thrombosis, etc. So for this specific condition, which hepatitis C may be here, we should not go for resection, but go directly for uh, liver transplantation. So here we can be a little bit more uh, accurate in our decision based on the etiology. And he just published the same group right now, some uh, diagram or suggestion how to do that, HEC resection, how to construct to go that. If they have no tumor, when you do it, of course, you don't go for that. And then you go to this criteria here, the, the, trait, the different criteria, we'll show you that. If they are here, then we go to liver transplantation before recurrence or you wait. So here, this is the concept of bridge. It's not that it's against liver uh, resection, but it will not wait for the recurrence and list this patient quickly. In Zurich, we will not go for liver resection. Most of the time, we'll go directly for liver transplantation or living related if we can. And the criteria here that he was suggesting was the microvascular invasion, satellite nodule, the size, the differentiation, and also the presence of liver cirrhosis, which is almost, almost always here. And if you have more than three of these factors, then you will not wait the recurrence, but you will put the patient on the uh, waiting list. Now, we had last year, I don't know if you're aware of that, but we had here a, a, a consensus conference. Uh, we took two years to organize about the role of liver transplantation for uh, HCC. I will not talk about that since that's not the topic here, uh, but uh, it was an interesting uh, brainstorming between the East and the West on evidence-based, and at the end, the recommendations were done by an independent jury, and we could have here all this society who contribute uh, to uh, this conference, and uh, that was a very interesting intellectual uh, exercise. I just want to, what time it is now? I have uh, As much as you need. It's all right. No, no. <laughs> I just wanted to share, because what I have said is not very exciting. I'm sure 99% of the audience, they already know everything I mentioned that here. So I wanted just to bring here something new that I do believe uh, will change probably a little bit what we will do. And this will be published, in fact, very soon in the uh, Annals of Surgery. I will show you, don't read the title. It's very difficult to read it. But it's done basically by a group of German surgeons. And this is put in place by Dr. Schlitt, who did, in fact, this operation uh, a little bit by chance. And I will show you what this operation is about, and then I may explain to you how Dr. Schlitt uh, did that. And here, they publish here 25 cases, five institutions, so that's very preliminary data with a pretty high mortality. In fact, they have, I think, 15 or 20 percent mortality. So it was an early stage of a challenging procedures. Uh, that I think will bring a lot, and we have done now, I mean, in Zurich, uh, 13 of these cases, and uh, I have with Dr. Santibanez from Argentina. The reason I ask him to also do that is that he did all about 15 of these procedures in Buenos Aires, and we have done 13 in, uh, in Zurich, and we suggested to call this operation, and explain what that is, uh, the Alps, maybe there's a bias to call that the Alps, right? <laughs> but we call that the Alps just to challenge the German because they don't have much of the Alps, but we have in Switzerland. So this is associating liver partitions, so associating liver partition with portal vein ligation for stage hepatectomy. So that's a little bit, and they call also in situ split. So what it is, let me go here, a little bit of the background, the way we have done until now, or the way we, we are thinking when we do major liver surgery. So here I'm aware a bit from the HCC and cirrhosis. This is exclusively in non-cirrhotic patient, whatever the reason for liver resection. So I think you're very familiar with, with this. You have a normal liver here, and we, whatever this cutoff here, so depending on the age, it's, uh, let's say 30%, when we resect up to 30% or we let behind 30% resect up to 70%, we will go ahead and we'll do it with very good outcome. And we know in very young patients, you can even go to probably 75% resection with very good outcome in the elderly less, whatever this figure is. If it's not the case, then we use what Makuchi 
put in place in the 80s, which is the portal vein embolization, would in the use in many centers here, and we try to increase this volume here. And if we do the portal vein, if we reach that, then we we'll go for resection. If we do not, probably we should never go for resection. So that's a bit the, the standard that most HPV centers uh, are doing. The development over the past, I will say, 12 years was the so-called two-stage procedure with many different uh, variations here. That's one we were applying uh, here. It was developed by, uh, initially by Daniel Jack in Strasbourg uh, with portal vein uh, embolization. We've modified that with ligation. That's not so important. But basically, you will have this condition, many uh, liver tumors here. And in the first stage, what do we do? We, we will res remove the tumor in the left part of the liver here and we ligate the portal vein, or you can embolize that. That's the first stage, usually extremely well tolerated, relatively benign that. Then we'll wait, and then what we hope with this ligature that we'll have a hypertrophy of the left side from this tumor, atrophy of this side, and if we reach the volume, then we will go for the second stage and basically cut here, whatever extended right, or right hemipatectomy, to get only healthy tissue. It takes between four weeks to 22 months here to get from here to here. And the other here is that if you look at the literature here, you will reach about 35% increase here, rarely more than this increase. And here's the novel operation, or this ALP operation, described by, by uh, Schlitt in Germany. Uh, and what they are doing here is basically the same that what we have done, but they add the in-situ split. So you do the same thing, you can remove that too, you ligate your portal vein, and then for those who do living-related liver transplantation know that very well, or split, this is exactly the same. You just split here, so at the end, what do you have? You cut the portal vein, we cut it at least here. You have the hepatic vein, here you have everything normal going here, and here you have only one hepatic artery going to this large mass from this, and then about, and that's what is extremely exciting here, six days later, between this and this, we have done in an average of six days, you have a dramatic increase of this part of the liver here, and you can go here one week later, and you can imagine there is no addition for those who do the surgery after three months or two months, it's a real nightmare to isolate this liver, to do the resection, and there is a mortality. Here you just go uh, six days later, and you can do that, and I will very briefly show you here the increase is 50-70%, so for those who have done research in the lab, you've never observed that in humans, you can have that in mice, or, or maybe in rabbits, but you have never seen that in, in a human, and now we have it with this technique in human. So how, just to make a story short, how Dr. Schlitt found that, I call him poor idea editorial, because I found I, I was very somewhat, I would have liked to have this idea, I did not. And I asked him how he came to these things. Very simply, he was doing a surgery, I know him, he's a very, I know if you know, he's a quiet surgeon, he came one and doesn't talk a lot, uh, known as being relatively aggressive, trained in Hanover, and what he was doing, a, a patient with cholangiocarcinoma, and he started to uh, dissect here, and then he could not he realize the tumor was a stage, a stage four, a four bismuth, whatever. But he decided, what we don't do today, to, to connect, uh, to do an hepaticojejunostomy on the left side. So he wanted to go here. So he went here, and he said, okay, I will do a palliation. This patient will die. So he went here. And then in order to prepare here for those who do that, it's not easy. He could not do it. So he had to transect the liver. So he transects in order to put his wrong Y here. So he did his wrong Y here. He transects uh, the liver, and then he was totally transected. And at the end, at least he gave us a bit of credit. He said, I know you were doing this portal vein ligation. So I did the same. So at the end, he just put a ligature on the other side and said, see what happened. And by interest, one week later, he did a CT and just saw a huge left. This is unbelievable. So he went back and took out the uh, right lobe of the liver. And then he did two other cases. Then the brother of, uh, of uh, Auke Lang, who is now working in Mainz, was working as a junior resident, called his brother, who's the chief in, uh, in, um, in Mainz, and told him, unbelievable what's happening here. And then Auke Lang said, okay, why not I do it too? And he started to do one case, and then people talk, and they collect these 25 cases, and this would be a feature in the annals. I personally believe this is very important. I show you some of our data now that we have done here. Just uh, that's the increase in volume. So that's before, so that, that's zero. After seven days, so the time we go for the second stage, we have an increase about 50 to 70 percent. And very interestingly, you do the second stage. So here you take out the disease lever. 
After that, you have again a huge increase here. So the reason this patient doesn't die here is because the liver that has only the artery on the right side acts as auxiliary transplant or auxiliary liver. So it keeps things going. It probably involved in regeneration. There's a lot of questions here. But when you take it out, there's another stimuli here, and the liver increase here inside. I can show you three, I mean, a few cases that we have done. I put that for another talk. But that was before that you can see the in-situ split. You can see here that's very on the CT. That's pretty uncommon here. And here, so that's before, and that's after 54%. This is one week. Here, this is 50%, 72% here in this. And sometimes we do also liver resection. And here, this is after, so one week after the second operation here. And you can see a dramatic increase, which in fact is 81% from, so that's after, it look like that's a hepatectomy. This is gone here. And here you have another one, plus 127 percent, and here plus 129 percent from the initial growth. So that's amazing the way they can grow. Some intraoperative pictures here that we've done here. So you have a liver here, you have a tumor on this side, many tumor on the other side. You can see another view here. So what we plan here, we do the, the in-situ split here. Here we have a tumor, so we will have to do in addition the in-situ split plus a resection on this side, we do all the volumetry before. You can see it's a simple, relatively simple wet resection, mostly segment two, not completely anatomic, so stay here, only segment three in this setting. And at the end, we have this resection here, and we have the in situ split, segment four so is intact. We don't take segment one here, and there was some fibrosis uh, in these patients. At the end, what we do here, we put a plastic here from one week to prevent any adhesion here, so to make the operation more uh, easy. That's at the time of the second operation here, eight days after surgery. That's what it looked like, the in situ split here with the portal vein on both sides, and we would like it, the portal vein here, for example, on the right side here was a patient with a cholangiocarcinoma with a PTC here, and that's the way it will like at the end of the second operation here. That's after regeneration. This liver was much smaller, and here it ended up as any uh, patient you will have operated here for um, a cholangiocarcinoma with an intrahepatic wound uh, in this setting, and that's the patient one day after this uh, surgery. Uh, Okay, I just go for the conclusion here for the HCC. I just wanted to share this with you. The HCC put a few things. So a non cirrhotic patient, non cirrhotic with well preserved surgical resection is the standard of care. I think nothing new here, and I think this is still the case. Laparoscopic resection, there will be another talk, so not much to say, but it's clearly appealing. Uh, for uh, this uh, patient. Liver transplantation is certainly the best oncology treatment in selective patients. No questions, at least that's our belief. Uh, and uh, the, all this discussion, I don't think it's so fascinating, it's controversial, and for each case we have to think a bit how we want to balance one uh, with the other one. And the major issue that we have not solved, no drug has done that yet, is this extremely high incidence and risk of recurrent disease uh, after uh, the surgery. I would like also to take advantage here being in Israel and being currently the president of the association, I would love to add here M Middle East or something here. This is the European Ep uh, African Hepatobiary Association, very active association with our first meeting. I think a few of you were there. Uh, like outside of Europe, we went in, in Cape Town. It's very dynamic. We are also in charge that's, that's, uh, of the, the HPB board. We, Dr. Xavier Rogers put in place on behalf of the association uh, the board of, uh, of uh, HPB uh, surgery now, and we are doing that regularly that, and we'll be delighted to include our here, this country, in this uh, association, and I will really encourage you to come here. The next meeting with the international will be in Paris, probably, as you know, very uh, soon. Hope a lot of people will come. We do also every year some consensus conference here. One will be organized also on behalf of this association next year, uh, uh, this year in December, about no endocrine tumor, also a topic with many uh, uh, unclear uh, situation. And our next official meeting will be in uh, Belgrade uh, in about a little bit more than a year uh, than now. And since I'm here and I'm making a lot of advertisement, I take advantage again. We had an interest in Colangio. I mean, there was a consensus conference from the HPB, and we recently uh, published in Hepatology. We want to put together a registry and a registry available to everybody who put the data in to compare their own results, a rare disease. Nobody has a lot of experience, a lot of unknown here, and we have a registry now here. I would be delighted here if, 
in Israel, uh, you will be interested, I'm sure you have this uh, disease, and again, no one in the world with basically no exception has large experience with this disease, and here this is the community of HPV surgeons that may enable us to go further uh, with this condition. It's very simple, I will not go in detail, so this is very self explanatory For example, here we still use uh, the bismuth classification, you just have to click here what the disease is, and for simplicity, we use the same thing for polar veins, since now we're more aggressive, some center with resection, the artery here, and at the end, the front of the tumor, there is automatically a staging that will come, and then you have access to uh, your data, you can download pictures, etc. And I thank you very much for your attention. This is our research team in Zurich. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Clavier. You could take all the time in the world. We could listen to you for another hour. It's all right. And any questions, any remarks from the audience? Yes, please. Uh, Professor Clavier, as always, a, an outstanding lecture. And I, um, I, I echo how outstanding the, the EHPBA meeting was in Cape Town, because I was there. Thank you. And, I, and I think it's just an outstanding opportunity for everyone to get together. But, my question really, um, I'm trying to understand the mechanism of the, this rapid regeneration in the ALPS procedure. I mean, what do, you, what do you think is the pathophysiology behind it? My first question. The second question is, do you think when, when you see um, 70 to 80% growth, do you think it's going to replace colovane embolization and uh, two-stage surgery six weeks later? I mean, this, is, this data is just fascinating. Well, that's too... Superb question, <laughs> I can just tell you. The first one, um, the, the group from Germany, they claim, and I think they are wrong, they claim that the, what the, 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 the reason why you don't have this regeneration when you do not split because of the collateralization, and they called the embolization versus ligation, and there is flow going, therefore it doesn't regenerate. That's the theory, I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong. So what's going on, I don't know. And we're doing biopsy, we look at that. My what I would speculate is when you do the in-situ split plus portal vein ligation, you trigger a huge inflammation here from the, this liver, right? TNF, IL-6, hepatic growth factor, we can name it. And I'm convinced that just go a huge cytokine and the other liver will just grow because of this, uh, this stimuli. But I, that's speculation. We don't know. That needs to, uh, to be studied. The next question is how to use this. Well, I mean, now we have done 13, so we don't have a lot to fix but we've done a few. I mean, number one, I will see what the enthusiasm is to do this surgery. This is not a half an hour surgery, as you can imagine. You have many tumors, etc. You need to do the in-situ splits. Uh, the group in Germany has a high mortality. We'll see. They may be the same in other places. There will not be zero mortality, but what you do, of course. Can we apply that for cholangio? I mean, we have done a three cholangio. And I was delighted. We always talk about non-touch technique, right? We have Peter Neuhaus going on the portal vein. Different people talk about it. When you do this surgery, you perfectly know that you never really not touch. Here, you are not touch. You are completely away. We don't even take care of this tumor. You just dissect. So I think here, it could be very attractive in this, uh, in this situation. I think we'll see. We are, and again, I will offer to any center we want. We just start. Uh, whether we will be able to complete, I don't know. We have three centers, a randomized trial, in fact, of these procedures versus the other one without the split. So split versus portal vein ligation, and we need about 60 patients uh, to this. It's clear that the regeneration will be different in one or the other one, but what the, our, um, our main endpoint here is this is free at six months. So we're not looking long-term survival, nobody. We've done two gallbladder cancer that we've never resected before. Do we help the patient in terms of long-term? I don't know. We can do it. Do we help that? I think would be the next uh, the next question. So case that we could not do before, we can do with this technique. For case that we could do either portal vein embolization or the previous two stage or this one, I think this is open. But I'm very worried that, I'm not worried, but I think like many, there's two possibilities here. What many things happen in surgery, the enthusiasm becomes so huge, like laparoscopic cholecystectomy, etc. that if people start to do this, they would never compare and we would never know what is compared to, to the other one, or it's so demanding to many centers that it may not be uh, adopted by uh, many centers. We'll see. I don't know if I answered the question. But, uh. 
Yeah, yeah. sure. Thank you. Yeah. Just a remark. I think it's uh, surgically is a very interesting approach, but I think we have to be cautious because we have to be looking at the long-term effect of this procedure. You mentioned the stimulation is huge. Maybe this will, uh, you know, encourage a recurrence in the future. We don't know. So we have to look on the long-term result of this procedure. There's no doubt. I know that we have to look at the, the long-term result. I'm not too worry about this, uh, this which has come very often that, you know, regeneration also induce uh, accelerated tumor. It may be true, but I think the data on that is relatively weak. But for sure, there's a lot of questions open. Well, may I ask a question? Yeah. What do you think, what is the quality of liver tissue after fast regeneration versus after a couple of weeks? How people, the patients, they are tolerating? I mean, after the... Well, I mean, it's also very good questions. I think the, I mean, the right answer is that we don't know exactly. I mean, how do you measure that? How do you decide that? Volume increase, no doubt. We do the ICG green. And with the ICG green, we have seen, not shown the slide that there is a dramatic decrease of the function. It happened. The quick go down after the, the first and the second operation. The ICG green go down in Argentina. They do a technician test also. So we do not know. It works. It's better. How much is better? Does that match the increase in volume? We don't know. But the trick here, Spray, is that the other liver act as an auxiliary liver. I mean, it's clear that in this case, sometimes with 19%, patient will die within a few days if you just take it out. You just keep the other one with the hepatic artery, and it permits here as an auxiliary for the patient to bridge, to survive, and the other liver will regenerate uh, during, uh, during that time. I think that's uh, that's the most important observation. I think from this. Uh. Well, thank you very much, Professor Clavian. That's an exciting news. I think that uh, it may well be important.